You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. I want to welcome back to the program. Uh, Charles Hoskinson uh, is with the Washington Examiner, and he's got a very timely article uh, discussing ISIS today. Of course, if you follow us on uh, Twitter or Facebook, you could uh, link right to it, and we're posting it right now in the chat as we're discussing it. But, uh, uh, Charles, it's always a pleasure to have you with us, and uh, thank you again for joining us today. Thanks for having me today. Well, I- I'm definitely disturbed by what I view now as, uh, you know, our president has declared war on ISIS, simultaneously saying no boots on the ground, um, not really willing to commit to this at all. Um, I hear reports about really not supporting the Kurds the way we should or other willing people who want to take on ISIS. Then you have the issue of Iran, the cooperation or coordination of, of, you know, to whatever degree that is. And then you have, again, no boots on the ground, but we've been bombing to some degree and some of our allies have joined in to a very small degree. However, it doesn't seem like we're putting a dent in what I would consider probably today's greatest threat of a terrorist organization besides Iran. Well, there are signs that that we're reaching the limit of how much can be done with air power alone. Even uh, U.S. officials are beginning to admit that that's that there are limits to that. But the the ground troops that President Obama thinks should be used in this case. Um, that is, the locals, the Syrians, the Iraqi military, the Kurds, there's a gap between what they can do right now and what they need to be doing to exploit the opportunities created by the bombing campaign. And that's the big problem that you see on the ground right now in places like Kobani and also around Baghdad. That's that's interesting, and um, and if we can, if we could just move to Syria. I mean, this is all it's all one zone at this point to me because the borders have been so blurred and and the, the lines are disappearing quickly. But when you, when you look at Syria, I think there's another major issue, and I, quite honestly, I don't even know how you begin to analyze how you deal with this and address it. But on one hand, we've already clearly said that Assad must go. Now, I don't know the last time we've repeated that, meaning our, our administration and, and our leadership. I'm sure you and I have. <laughs> but you you have Hassad still in power. The Russians clearly want him to stay. Iran absolutely wants him to stay. And it seems like anything we do against ISIS or anything we do that may uh, diminish the forces that are facing Assad are are helping those who we really I mean that we don't want to help. It's a very very complex and complicated web, and, and I I think this is a time where boy, if you ever wanted your best uh, strategist militarily, who I think a lot of them have retired recently or have been forced out, I want them all back to the table to figure this one out. Well, it, it is indeed. I mean, Syria is the biggest problem right now because you have well, first of all. As you said, you have the regime, the Assad regime, and it continues to get support from Russia and from Iran. And you have the the resistance, such that it is, a a variety of different factions. Of course, the most one of the most effective factions against the Assad regime was ISIS. And now you have the United States and its coalition engaged in an aerial bombing campaign against ISIS, and the regime. You know, there's a very strong perception among the the forces on the ground in Syria that that the United States wants to work with that the regime is the biggest beneficiary of that air campaign right now. You have Turkey, which is sitting sitting it out unless they get guarantees that that this strategy is going to lead to the end of the Assad regime. And meanwhile, you, as the Pentagon said today, there aren't really any reliable allies for the United States on the ground. The people that the U.S. wants to train, you know, part of President Obama's strategy was to train Syrian rebels in Saudi Arabia. It's going to take, the Pentagon said today, it's going to take at least five months just to start this process. Then it's going to take a year to train these guys, 5,000 at a time. So it could be years before you have a significant force on the battlefield. 
Charles, I think that's one of the most important points that we have here is we are not only are we looking at years, but to me, I don't know how we can have any guarantee of either A, that these people will not just put their weapons down and run, that the same as, I mean, we've already spent billions training them and billions more giving them hardware, all of which immediately, immediately evaporated. So there's that side. Then there's the side of no trust. And we've already seen that even our generals aren't safe from pretending that these guys are actually our friends. And I'm a big fan of actually taking more control in our own hands, using our own troops, using air power as effectively as possible with special forces to do the heavy lifting and then leave it up to these guys to some degree to clean up the mess. I, I'm actually, a, uh, I worry greatly about trying to work too closely to them because any operation could be compromised greatly. And I just make uh, the quick point of look what happened to the SEAL Team 6 not too long after we took out Obama. Now, there's discussions whether that was done on purpose, whether that was a payback, whether that, you know, wh whatever the case may be, clearly that operation was compromised. And I think our men and women in uniform are safer if we do almost all the lifting. And it's possible that, that Americans would be safer, but this is the one thing that the, the administration absolutely will not do. So as you look at Syria today, you're faced with you're faced with the uh, situation. If you look at Kobani, for example, it's a good example. The Kurdish town, what the Arabs call Ain al Arab, which ironically means Arab Spring. Um, if you look at uh, you, you have Kurdish forces there, Kurdish militias fighting for their lives, being besieged by ISIS, and, and the U.S. bombardment is helping them. But even the Pentagon admitted today that the, it, it, that we need to all steal ourselves for the eventual fall of that town and other Syrian towns, that the United States just can't prevent ISIS from gaining ground in Syria right now. It's because the president, you know, the, the administration will not use American boots on the ground. And, and even though you mentioned concerns about using local fighters, even they don't exist right now. I mean, we're, we're not even at the point where we can worry about whether the people we're arming and training are, are going to turn on us because they don't exist. Charles, there's, there's two other uh, things I want to touch on here. One is the fact that while I think it's perfectly reasonable and understandable that, not, uh, that each of our allies is not always going to be in lockstep agreement with us and that their opinions also matter, but I wanted you to comment on your feelings about Turkey in particular right now, because Turkey is supposedly sitting on the sidelines because they want they want protection against uh, Islamists and so forth, or, or terrorists is what, what we would think of as Kurds, and they're sitting there basically allowing this decimation and not uh, joining the fight. Do you think we're getting to a point where Turkey needs to be put on notice that even its position in NATO is questioned, or does Turkey have a right to basically just sit on the sidelines and we have no right to try to coerce them. Well, Turkey clearly has its own agenda. And first of all, they they want Assad out. They've, they've made that clear at the highest level. The prime minister said that. Assad needs to go. That's a condition of them getting involved in Syria. I mean, they have for years complained that the United States hasn't paid enough attention to Syria but they have no desire to, uh, you know, they, they want an outcome in Syria that's favorable to them. And their, the other major interest of theirs is to ensure that the Kurds are, to put it bluntly, kept on a leash. I mean, the Kurdish, the Kurdish forces in Kobani reportedly include militias that are, are hostile to Turkey, that Turkey considers terrorists, like the PKK, which is fought, that, that's a Turkish Kurdish group that has fought a guerrilla war against Ankara for years. So the the Turks aren't necessarily uh, aren't necessarily in any hurry to help the Kurds because people in the West say, "Oh my God, this is about to lead to a slaughter." So they they definitely have their own agenda on, on the question of whether they they should be involved or whether they they should be pressured to get more involved. I don't expect the United States to, to put too much pressure on Turkey. I mean, the, the, the administration has been very careful to, I mean, while they say the Turks should have, have a, definitely have an interest in Syria, they should care 
what's happening in Syria. Uh, they've been the administration officials have been very careful not to indicate any uh, frustration or disgust with Turkey's position. Charles, do you believe let's let's say that we cut a deal with the Turks to make sure that Assad was taken out? Do you believe that we could even take Assad out without crushing the Iranian mullahs, or does that simply leave us in a situation where Hezbollah kind of moves in as the, uh, you know, uh, a pan-ISIS uh, or Islamic State region's uh, Iranian proxy power, making Iran effectively even stronger than it is today? Well, taking uh, going directly against Assad would put the United States in direct conflict with Hezbollah, and possibly also with Iran, because they, they are supporting him. Um, that raises another question of uh, what would happen to the nuclear talks. I mean, the administration hasn't given up on that. It's, it's one of their highest priorities to get a nuclear deal with Iran. It, it's a, a touchy situation for them, because confronting Iran directly, if that provokes Tehran to pull out of the talks, that's that's a pretty high price from their perspective to pay. Well, that, that's from their perspective, but I I think a lot of us would wonder why are we even having discussions when we had clearly years back made statements of this is how we feel about what you're doing, and it seems like we've we've walked away from any kind of demands that we've put on I, Iran to the point where we now see Iran seriously involved in Syria. They've backed all the terrorist organizations for years. They're in Iraq. They're constantly speaking. That, now they just openly, I mean, as clear as day, make open, clear statements against the interests of the United States. They have fought us. They have provided aid and weapons and training to anyone who's fought against us for decades now. And uh, so the, the question I guess I would have for you is, why are we, and Turkey hasn't been you know, not nearly as bad, but Turkey has their own issues. Why are we so worried about offending Iran or offending Turkey or even Russia, for that matter? And I just don't understand. It's like we'll, we'll offend our own allies. Look what we've said and done to Israel or Britain or, or others, and we, we're the opposite with the real threats. Well, it's not just Israel. I mean, there are a lot of people in Turkey and in the Arab world who – you know, a lot of thoughtful people, this is not just a wild-eyed conspiracy theory, who believe mm -hmm. that the United States is tilting towards Iran in the Middle East. They're, they don't see any evidence that the United States is trying to roll back Iranian influence in Iraq or Syria. Um, the Iranian-backed rebels have gained ground in Yemen. Um, that they, they, they think that the United States is tilting towards Iran for the sake of of achieving some kind of a reconciliation with Tehran, and and that colors how they behave towards how they behave towards the United States. It colors colors their willingness to support U.S. policy. It's almost certainly a factor in Turkey's reluctance to join the coalition. It was probably something that, that needed to be overcome in dealing with Saudi Arabia, dealing with the United Arab Emirates. Um, it's in every in every Arab country that feels itself the or any Sunni Muslim country, not just the Arabs but the Turks in the Middle East that feel feel the hot breath of Iran breathing down their necks, people are going to uh, wonder if the whose side the United States is on. I wonder. <laughs> I mean, I, I, we've, John and I have been discussing this for a while now. I feel as though this administration is like holding hands with Iran. I, 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 I don't get it at all. And if you're a member of our military, God bless them for what they do. You have to be shaking your head wondering what your commander-in-chief is doing. You're on a battlefield watching your, your, your brothers and your sisters go home, you know, harmed, sometimes missing arms, legs, or in a body bag, at fighting against these same people that your president seems to want to sit down and, and be friends with. Mm -hmm. Well, for the record, the United States, you, the administration insists that it's not cooperating with Iran and will not cooperate with Iran against ISIS. But the United oh. States is allied with and is cooperating with and is helping forces against ISIS that are getting help from Iran, like the Iraqi government. The Kurds are getting help from Iran. 
Um, the United States is not taking any steps against Iran's ally in Syria, Bashar al-Assad, um, and the United States is still determined to have friendly discussions with Tehran about about the nuclear program. So, it, it's you know, if you look at it from an if if you were sitting in an Arab capital, you'd certainly uh, you certainly might think that Washington and Tehran were that Tehran is more important to Washington than they are. Well, let, let's use some real examples. I mean, I mean, this administration has eased up on sanctions. I mean, they they went we we went through such great lengths to get people to sign on board with those sanctions to begin with, and then we start easing up on them. But what do we get in exchange? For what reason? Then we know, and there's clear evidence that Iranian weapons have been moved into Gaza and other places, which have been used throughout the Middle East. We know what they're involved in. We're we're turning a blind eye. I mean, and, and in, when you have Saudi Arabia and, and other people who have been long-term allies giving us information and talking to us, and then we, we almost ignore them, what else does it tell you? I mean, I, I think it's very clear, actually. They may not say it and use the words, and they may, in fact, say the opposite, but I always say, actions speak louder than words. Well, I, I think it's one of the great mysteries right now. I mean, I, I can't offer you any evidence of where the United States is is actively working to counter Iran's efforts to expand its influence in anywhere in the Middle East. Um, right. But it, it's playing that is playing a role in a lot of uh, a lot of changes that are going on in the region. I mean, if you look at the last Gaza war, you you would one of the, one of the key factors was that it wasn't just Israel that was blockading Gaza; it was Egypt. The Egyptians were one one thing that was missing from. Uh, previous times was uh, the ability of the of Hamas to resupply itself through Egypt the Egyptians have uh, are are not not in love with Hamas right now to say the least and and it, Iran's support has a role in that Iran's support for uh rebels in Yemen plays a role in that um, Iran's the the situation in Bahrain is is in part based on uh, concerns from other Gulf countries about Iran's role there, and Turkey's re- I, as I said, Turkey's reluctance to get involved with the coalition is also in part colored by concerns about uh, the Iran-supported Assad regime. Now, let's give an ounce of credibility both to the genius behind the uh, ISIS uh, uh, brutes, uh, as, as well as some of the other uh, states, the uh, Arab states. In the Arab world, in the broader Muslim world, commitment and strength are deeply respected. Submission and weakness are, are deeply despised. And brutality is really nothing more than an evil form of strength. And I think it's one of the things that ISIS has been very, very smart at from their perspective is that their brutality is so extreme that when we come in with a weak hand, when our president plays even our air war at a, at a very, you know, a lightweight level, like a semi-commitment, a soft commitment at best, they know that, the people on the ground sense that, and they understand that they're, they're, if they're going to submit to somebody, it's not going to be to America's distant power with, with a waning commitment. It's going to be to the people who they know will rip their heads off. And I think that's one of the problems that we're having with having any real support on the ground. Yeah, that, that may be true, and some people say that that's true. But in reality, I think there's something more important at work here. Uh, remember, in these countries, you, you're talking about countries that don't have the rule of law, don't have democracy. They haven't had the rule of law for decades, if not longer. Um, it, you know, if you if you have a problem with the government, you can't just go to a court and sue them. Uh, and, and what happens is people, you know, like Sunni Muslims who look at, uh, for example, a government in Iraq that they perceive as sectarian. Uh, or a government in Syria that they perceive as as completely against their interests, and they look at ISIS. A lot of people, a lot of times, they make the least worst choice. They look and say, "Hmm, you know, should I go with the guys who will who will only kill me if I don't do what they say, or should I go with the guys 
who would kill me because of who I am. And and you see you're seeing a lot of a lot of these least worst choices. This is why you see, for example, a lot of Christians in, in the Middle East angling towards Iran or Iranian backed movements like Hezbollah. There are a lot of Christian supporters of Hezbollah in Lebanon. There are a lot of uh, Christians in Syria who have aligned themselves with the regime because they're going to, you know, they look at ISIS. ISIS will kill them because they're Christian. They kill them on sight. If you know, it, even a, a regime that would oppress them is is more desirable than that. So, so you have a lot of people who, you know, I mean, one of the biggest problems is with it, it, in Iraq is getting the uh, the Sunni tribes in Iraq to fight with the government, a government that they believe has over the past few years oppressed them. Hmm. Uh, Chuck, we have about a minute left. Uh, it, it seems to me, when you look at all of these nations, and there's numerous w- with problems, that over the last decade or, or more, but let's just call it the last decade, it seems like it's the extremism on both sides, Sunni, Shia, but in these countries that have elevated the conflict. And I think that to even begin to repair or 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 i guess stop the continued uh you know problem from spiraling out of control you have to deal with the extreme elements and and i <coughs> suppose that's one of the reasons why we're all looking for the removal of assad and the removal of a lot of these major players but again as you so eloquently pointed out what do you replace that with that's that's true i mean if you have you know, you, if you have no rule of law, you have no democracy, you have no history of it, you have to start from square one. You look at Iraq, where the United States, which the United States occupied for eight years, you know, in Iraq, politics is, uh, is war by other means. You win an election, the people who win an election, they think it gives them license to throw all their defeated opponents in jail or go after their families, steal all their money. As long as that continues... You're you're not going to be able to effectively fight extremism. Yeah, it, it's almost like in this region you have to start disarming the region, not adding more arms, and start bringing factions to the table to say, hey, even if we have to redraw lines and move things around to resolve this, and you know that'll never happen. But uh, you know, th- like I said, this is incredibly complex, and I'm interested to see what how this unfolds. But I'm not expecting the best. Well, we're we're at least a generation behind on building the kind of political structures and political support that that we should yeah. have been doing to uh, get stable, non-extreme, you know, political structures in those countries. Yeah, absolutely. Charles Hoskinson, he's got a great piece in the Washington Examiner: Fatal Flaw in Obama ISIS Strategy. We have a post on our social media. Go check it out, read it, and follow uh, Charles. Thank you very much. We'll talk again soon. Thanks for having me.